What's up, Playboys? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick, Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. Wrapping up the last of the NFC North team outlooks with the Detroit. <coughs> Woo! With the Detroit Lions, wearing my blue cap in honor of Detroit. If you need a hot dad hat for the summer, Big Dogs Gotta Eat got you. Go check them out on the website, which I'll link below. Very simple, minimal, just the logo on the front. Got them in four different colors. Go check them out. Also, if you need anything for your fantasy football league, I'm talking about draft board kits, which is right here. Championship belts, trophies, rings. There's a, a link down below. It's my affiliate link. Go check that out. They have the best gear, I swear. I've been using them for the last two or three years. Company has excellent product. But enough of the plug. Also, thank you to our sponsors, Monster. Y'all the GOAT for not really sponsoring me. But I still like your shit. Anyways, let's get into some fantasy football stuff. We gotta kick it off with Matt Stafford. When you look at Stafford, a lot of people go pretty big on him year in and year out. And it's because he had that 41 touchdown year back in the day, right? He hasn't been able to come close to that number since. However, he's a really high floor fantasy quarterback. He's he's thrown for 4,200 passing yards each of the last six seasons. I'm not gonna go fact check that, but if I had to bet, I don't think any other quarterback has done that. If you consider injuries and things like that, which factor into fantasy. A very high floor quarterback. I do think their offense is evolving a little bit, right? He had an average depth of target at 6.9 in 2015, shot up a full yard to 7.9 in 2016, probably because he had the additions of a guy like Marvin Jones. That being said, it's still 25th in the league, so they are not a high-flying offense yet. I'm not sure they ever will be, at least under Jim Bob Kuda. However, he did finish last season as quarterback seven in fantasy overall, and that was behind Football Outsiders 18th ranked pass blocking line, so not a good line. They went out and signed TJ Lang and Ricky Wagner to shore up that line. Both players finished in Pro Football Focus's top 10 ranking of pass blocking and top 20 overall. However, I was really excited about that because I thought I, I thought that little nugget of, of them signing these, these guys, it would be the best offensive line that not only him, but Amir Abdullah would have to work behind. But they lost their left tackle, Taylor Decker, this offseason to injury, which is going to be a big blow. So, I mean, they gained some right guard, right tackle. However, his backside's open. We'll have to see how this plays out. It, it's interesting because over the last six seasons, as I said, he's never gone under 4,200 yards. He's averaged 635 pass attempts, which is very high. He's never gone under 592 attempts. But last year, he threw one or fewer touchdowns in nine of the 16 games he played in. So the inconsistency is there. The overall numbers will be there because of the volume, which will continue to come in. He finished with 4,327 passing yards, 24 to 10 touchdown interception ratio. He's consistently between that like 10 to 15 ranking in fantasy, especially on a points per game basis. So what I will say is if you're a late round quarterback guy, he's not the worst guy to pick for sure. He will give you that baseline of yardage. If yardage is more important in your league, maybe Stafford definitely becomes more valuable. I'm not sure how, how highly the touchdown number will soar up. I do like the fact that he'll have, he'll have a healthy Eric Ebron for the season, which would be nice in the in the red zone, but he's just a high floor fantasy quarterback at the, at the low end, quarterback one, probably high end, quarterback two range. So you talk about his weapons. They signed Marvin Jones from the Bengals, man. I loved Marvin Jones last year. He was on like all of my sleeper lists. I was so high on the dude. Fast forward a quarter of the way through the season, Marvin Jones is wide receiver three in fantasy. I'm like, oh, I'm a fucking beast. Fantasy God among the fantasy frauds. I'm like, let's go. He hasn't gone under 75 receiving yards in a game. Exploded for a 200 yard, two touchdown game in that first four weeks. I'm like, I was on point with that. So naturally, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong in fantasy football. From week five on, Jones finished as wide receiver 65 in fantasy. And see, these are some of his individual stat lines in those 11 games. Two catches, 10 yards, one catch, five yards, one catch, 15 yards, one catch, 16 yards. It's pretty clear that he can't be a wide receiver one. Sorry, I'm pulling up his ADP because I write these articles before I actually make the videos. So I want to make sure I have the most up to date ADPs when I do these. So Marvin Jones is currently going as 116th overall around wide receiver 45, 46. So what I will say is I think there's value there for Marvin Jones. I think he is a pretty easy bet to have around 90 to 100 targets, maybe more. Because remember, this offense does throw a shitload. Marvin Jones had 103 targets last year. 
So I think he could definitely match that number. I just don't think the consistency will be there enough for him to hit anything more than wide receiver four numbers. In PPR formats, he actually finished lower at wide receiver 42 than his teammate Anquan Bolden, who finished at wide receiver 41. Now, Bolden's not really expected to return to the team. He's sitting out. He said he doesn't really want to return to a team until, like, training camp, which is, you know, he, he he's an old dude, bro. This could be big news because Anquan Bolden, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, had the ninth most targets inside the 10-yard line of any wide receiver slash tight end slash running back in the NFL last year. He had nine targets inside the 10-yard line. That's a huge portion of those targets missing now. So who's gonna take those targets? Could be Marvin Jones, could be a lot of Eric Ebron. Like I said, I don't think Bolton's coming back. I think he wants to play, I think I saw a report that says he wants to play in Miami or Florida in that area where his, like, where his house is. So I don't think he's coming back to Detroit, but there is one rookie wide receiver that has been glowing in off-season programs. His name's Kenny. Galladay. Gall I think I'm saying that right. He was their third round pick. He's a big dude. 6'4", 218. He's going at wide receiver 65 right now, 210 overall. So basically undrafted. All reports have uh, have this guy just absolutely killing it at camp. ESPN's line reporter Michael Rothstein's assumption of the rookie winning the third spot on the depth chart will hold true. He's a big target. Measured out really, really well at the combine. Crazy college production between North Dakota and NIU. Extremely strong hands. He only dropped five balls on 165 catchable targets. Um, so all around has, has really good upside here, has a lot working for him. And if he can, you know, eat into Marvin Jones's numbers, like who knows what, what could happen there. I think he's a very high upside, really late round pick, good for a keeper. Definitely keep an eye on him for Dynasty. Like I said, they just throw the ball a ton. Galladay will probably compete with, um, they picked up the Packers wide receiver, Jared Aberderis. Aber Aber so one of those guys that always gets like super hyped up in the preseason because he's a Packers wide receiver and they expect him to uh, yada, yada, yada. But they'll compete. I expect Galladay to win that third receiver spot. So that'll be interesting. And then obviously we have to talk about Golden Tate. The wide receiver won there. Tate's a, you know, a PPR owner's dream. 13th most targeted wide receiver in the NFL last year. It's gone over 90 catches for the third straight year. Went over a thousand yards, averaged over nine targets a game over their final 11 games. He's not involved in the in the red zone, near the end zone, which is always a big hit, but who knows now with Bolden gone. Uh, Bolden ran a lot of those over the middle routes. Golden Tate might take over some of those, but his floor is just super safe. You could easily compare a Golden Tate to a Jarvis Landry. Both guys catch a ton of balls. What I like is that there's not much that has changed in this offense for Tate, except for Bolden's being gone. For Jarvis Landry, you have his numbers dipped really heavily over the end of the year because J.J. was getting way more involved and now they add Julius Thomas to the mix. So it's kind of Jarvis Landry going this way, Golden Tate going up. He's 28 years old. He's still young. Him going at wide receiver 24 in PPR leagues right now, that's his ADP, is just out of control because he's finished as wide receiver 17 last year, finished as 24 in 2015, and as wide receiver 12 in 2014. So his lowest finish of the last three years in PPR was wide receiver 24, and now he's getting picked at 24. And he's finished well above that two other times. So I think he's a great value. I think he's the guy that I would gladly skip on Landry for, wait around, and take Tate. So now we got to talk about Eric Ebron, obviously. Top 10 pick by the Lions in 2013. Um, you know, the question you're in and you're out is, will he ever be that elite receiving tight end? I don't think we're going to see that. But I think the question becomes, it, can he be an every week starter for your fantasy team? Let's we'll start with the bad. Ebron has yet to play more than 14 games in a season since entering in 2013. Injury risk. In 40 career games, he has just seven touchdowns. In 2014 and in 2016, he had one touchdown in each of those seasons. So he needs to score more. And he needs to stay on the field more. The good news, though, is that his target, receptions, and receiving yards total has gone up. It has increased every single year since he's been in the league. Here's my problem. Since entering the league, since coming into the NFL in 2013, Ebron has nine targets total inside the opponent's 10-yard line. Since entering the league, Eric Ebron has nine total targets inside the opponent's 10-yard line. Yes, that wasn't an editing mistake. I was repeating for emphasis. For a big tight end, you can't get, it doesn't get done like that. Anquan Bolden had that many just last season and the guy's like 55 years old. So you can make the case year in and year out that this is the year he starts getting more of those targets and his touchdown total rises. And it would make sense this year now that Bolden is gone, Eric Ebron is going into the year healthy as he always is going into the year healthy. He's getting picked at like tight end 11, 12-ish, 105th overall. So I think he has good value there. If you're gonna wait on a tight end, I do like his upside because they pass so much. 
Bolden's gone. He's increased his statistics basically every year coming in. He just needs to get a little more involved in the red zone, and Ebron could have a big year. So I don't hate Ebron in that range. And now we get to the running backs. If you followed me this offseason, you know that Amir Abdullah is one of my favorite breakout players. And I'm so mad that Taylor Decker got hurt and he's going to be out because that line would have been... Oh, this would have been the best line Abdullah's had to work with since he's come in the league. And he hasn't even been that bad. He, he's averaging his career. He's only 161 attempts, so not a huge sample size. But 4.34 yards per carry behind the 22nd ranked run blocking line and the 31st ranked run blocking line in the previous two seasons. Like I said, they added two top top 20 blocking linemen, TJ Lang, Ricky Wagner, again, Taylor Decker, ugh, it's a killer. But you know, I believe in Abdullah's talent. I believe that he's not injury prone. He played all of his games in college. He played 16 full games his rookie season. Just happened to have one injury last season. So I, I know it's a what, what have you done for me lately league, but I think that Abdullah still is that guy. I'm not worried about his injuries. And I, I think the line overall will be improved with the addition of two guys and a minus one add two. I don't know if that's how that works. He's just been praised so heavily this offseason. I just think this is the year that everything comes together for Abdullah. And I'm really excited to see uh, how that works. And obviously you have Theo Riddick there who takes a lot of the passing down work. I don't think he's going to be just spelled out of the offense here. He's not going anywhere. He's still going to be the main pass catching back. But Abdullah is more than athletic enough to, to handle 30 to 35 catches. That's a huge part of their offense is dumping the balls off. So there's a plenty of opportunity to go around for both guys. Even if Riddick still catches 60, Abdullah can catch 35, 40, even 45 passes from the quarterback. So I'm not really worried about that. He gets the early down work. And we're going to have to see how the goal line work splits up because they did just add Matt Asiata. They have Zach Zenner, but I, I think Zach Zenner's talent is irrelevant while Abdullah is healthy. Matt Asiata has obviously been like a goal line back for the majority of his career, so it's possible they use him down there. This definitely makes Abdullah a little bit riskier. But Abdullah is getting picked like 60 overall, uh, running back 21-22 off the board. It's behind Tevin Coleman, just in front of CJ Ander Anderson. I would easily take him over both guys. I think his upside is through the roof. I think his talent is crazy. I think this is the year that it finally gets put on showcase. I'm definitely okay picking him there. I'm, I'm definitely okay. In a couple of my leagues, I'll definitely be reaching around earlier than his ADP to make sure I get him on my team. So that's that. What do I have? I have Stafford is a very nice high floor quarterback um, in the 10 to 15 range. I think Golden Tate is severely undervalued at wide receiver 24 in PPR. He's easily hit that or surpassed it in each of the last three seasons. Then you have Eric Ebron, who I like because Anquan Bolden's now gone, who had a ton of targets inside the 10, and that's where Ebron always um, lacked, his game always lacked, and now that Bolden's gone, or likely gone, Ebron should see a lot more opportunity there. And lastly, of course, Abdullah, my breakout guy. I'm, I'm all in on Abdullah this year. So that is my Detroit Lions forecast fantasy outlook, and that'll wrap up the NFC North as well. Next, we'll move over to, what have we done? NFC East, West, North, and South. Ooh, this should be a good one. Ton of offensive weapons in the South. In the dirty, dirty, I gotta wear my Falcons jersey, I guess, for every single video there. So um, if you enjoyed, please just scroll down a little bit, give it the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and you enjoy it. I gave you some information, some value somewhere. And again, check out the hats on the site. This will all be linked in the description. I'll see you guys next time. I appreciate you spending your time with me today.